a secret double life, fooling everyone around him. His friends were totally oblivious to the fact that he was spending his afternoons robbing banks. He uses his charm to win over the cops. We'll give you a Your average bank robber is look that guy. Now, the FBI must identify the bandit and put a stop to his bank robbing spree. Sometimes try to escape from justice. This is the story of how one man almost got away with it. 1985, San Diego, California. At approximately 4.45 p.m., a first-time bank robber takes his place in line. He waits for the next teller, a note clenched in his hand. 23-year-old Joel Loya is no stranger to crime. For the past two years, he's been a small-time fellow. Today, he's ready to raise the stakes. What happens in the next two minutes will change the entire course of his life. You walk into a bank and now it's 4.45 and banks close at 5 in those days. So this is it. I put my fanny back on the counter and I slatter the snow. And... We have a bomb. I have a gun. Give me the money now. The teller reads the note slowly, refusing to make eye contact with Loya. Fifteen seconds go by. You have to push yourself past this threshold of fear. If you don't come with some momentum, some rage or something like that, you're just going to bump up against your fear and, and, and be repelled, you know? So that's what was going on. I was scared to death. I was going into a new territory, and I finally just say, hey, give me the money now, or I'll blow your effing head off. Loya passes his waistband to signal that he is armed. I let her believe that I have this weapon, just like I wanted her to believe I have a bomb. Finally, the teller opens her drawer. She passes a wad of bills over the counter. I walk out of the bank. Turn left, and I start running. Loya flags down a taxi. As he climbs in, two patrol cars rush by. Moments later, Loya is alone in a San Diego motel. Count 300 bucks is a lot of money, you know, for five minutes of work. Loya's got a plan in mind. Hide out in Mexico and make his fortune robbing banks in the U.S. I know that Pancho Villa used to go up into the United States. He would commit his crimes over a post office banks and then he'd scoot back into Mexico. This is my game. I'm a bank robber now. The next day, Loya gets into a car he'd stolen just days earlier. As he heads for the Mexican border, there's a massive traffic jam. It's just bumper to bumper. Now there's cars behind me. We're all stalled and I don't understand why. Loya panics. He's worried that the police might be looking for him. But when he pulls up to the border crossing point, he realizes that they're doing a random check for stolen vehicles. A policeman runs a check on his car. Run that off for me if you don't mind. Lawyer knows he's in trouble. He's driving a stolen car. I'm somebody else. I tell them I'm borrowing a friend's car from Mexico. Sir, go ahead and step out of the vehicle for me. What seems to be the, the border point? patrol isn't buying Loya's story. They run a background check and discover that Loya has five warrants out for his arrest. Loya is sentenced to two years in a California prison for check fraud and car theft. Authorities confiscate the money he's carrying, but never bring him to the San Diego bank robbery. While in prison, all Loya can think about is the adrenaline rush from the bank robbery and how he got away with it. He starts formulating a new career. The whole time I'm thinking, I'm going to rob banks when I get out. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to rob banks. I'm not going to do fraud anymore. I'm not going to do strong arm robbery. I'm not going to do that theft auto. It's all about bank robbery. January 1988. After two years, Loya gets out of prison. He's transformed, stronger, 
and bolder. By March, he's ready to get back in the game. He abandons his original plan of crossing between Mexico and the U.S. Instead, he decides to build up his bankroll in California, then flee to Mexico for good. He drives around Los Angeles, searching for the right bank to rob. Finally, he pulls up to a strip mall. Loya patiently waits in line. Then, he hands over a deposit slip with a message. Teller hands over the bills. He warns the clerk not to call the police. Oh my God! <laughs> that man just robbed. When I walked out of the bank, I didn't get in my car and drive away. I walked through the parking lot very casually, and I could turn around and I would see when people walked out of the bank, they would immediately start looking for the getaway car to escape unnoticed. Loya's strategy is to park his car about a quarter mile from the bank. This way, he'll blend in with the crowd as he walks through the parking lot. They never saw me. And I would get to my car and I'd drive away. They never saw what kind of car I drove. At his car, Loya immediately changes his outfit. He wants to make sure witnesses are unable to identify him. Then, he drives away just as the cops are racing to the bank. And I'd go home that night and I'd feel incredibly mellow, incredibly mellow. And I would take myself to a nice restaurant in Santa Monica or something. By 1988, Southern California is known as the bank robbery capital of the world, averaging 1,400 robberies per year. It was a situation here in Los Angeles where there were so many robberies that we needed to keep track of these individual serial bandits. FBI agent William Rader steps up to the task. He takes on the role of bank robbery coordinator for the Los Angeles division. His job is to review and analyze every serial bandit in the area. Then, he must determine which bank robberies they're responsible for. By July 1988, Raider has been closely following Loya's robberies. He's not surprised that the bandits already robbed four banks must understand that virtually every bank robbery is committed by a serial bandit. Nobody robs just one bank. They're like eating potato chips or cocktail peanuts. Nobody has just one. Ritter examines the only shreds of tangible evidence, bank surveillance photos. He carefully analyzes these photos and comes up with a profile for the bandit. I thought initially, because he was robbing so consistently, that uh, perhaps he was a hardcore narcotics addict, a hype, as we would, uh, as we termed them at the time. However, surveillance photographs uh, belayed that fact. He was always dressed very well, uh, whether it was in casual attire or business casual attire, uh, including a sport jacket. Sometimes um, he even appeared in a suit. And Not knowing the bandit's identity, Raider comes up with a nickname for the suspect. He had a very deep brown mocha-like complexion. He also had dark, almost jet black hair, which he combed very neatly. In this particular instance, with the Middle Eastern appearance, um, I assigned a nickname, uh, the Beirut Bandit. By day, the Beirut Bandit leads a secret double life. His friends and family have no clue that Loya is a fellow. He had quite a style about him. He dressed in nice suits. He read the Wall Street Journal. His friends tended to believe that maybe he was making money in the stock market. He liked to play golf. He voted Republican. He had set up this kind of uh, Mexican Gordon Gecko persona about himself. It wasn't hard to have this double life because I had been raised double. My dad was a complete fraud. Loya's friend helps him get a job as a sous chef at a Pasadena restaurant. Everyone was really excited because there was someone new coming to the restaurant. Joe came in and we just heard him laugh. And he brought so much energy with him. And I liked him immediately. I thought he was beautiful. He had um, dark hair that was combed back to his head. He had these 
this great smile. I'm in love with you, honey. When he was at work, he was consistently laughing, consistently telling jokes, consistently making people happy. I, I don't think I ever saw him where he was down. And you want to be around someone like that. He uses this job as the perfect alibi. When I was going to rob a bank, I would have somebody work on my time card. So I would tell these guys, hey, man, I'll pay you 150, 175 bucks for you work my shift. And they were like, of course. The guys were always picking on my shift, and I would go rob a bank. And I would have a time card that saying that I had worked that day, thinking that that was going to be my alibi. By September 1988, the Beirut bandit has gotten away with 10 robberies in the Southern California area in just over eight months. His next target, a bank in Riverside. This time, he decides to ditch the note. But over time, he started to notice small little ways where he could make his job even more efficient. Instead of passing notes through the teller window, he would just verbally say, give me the money, because it took less time and the person knew directly what he was talking about. Loyal walks inside and waits for the next available teller. I walk over there, she's smiling at me. How you doing, sir? I'm all right, I'm all right. I put my fanny pack on the counter, and then I lean in close, and I tell her, we have a bomb, I have a gun, give me the money now, I'll blow your effing head off. She just started with the big thing. Loya keeps his eyes locked on the teller. He's afraid that she might pass out at any moment. Finally, she opens the drawer. Open it, give me the big bills first, turn around, close the drawer, and walk away, don't look back. Now the entire that she's giving me the money, I'm just throwing money in my bag because I don't want to lose eye contact with her. Loya stuffs the bills into his bag. Then he spins around and walks out the door. As soon as he steps onto the sidewalk, his bag explodes. I'm crossing the street all of a sudden, boom! And the bag flies out of my hand. And there's this big plume of red smoke coming out of my bag. The teller had placed an exploding die pack in the stacks of bills. Then the bank alarm goes off. Loya has to think fast. When the bag dropped on the street, there was no thinking twice. I have to take this bag with me and have my fingerprints on it. Loya reaches for the bag. His eyes suddenly start to burn. It's tear gas. I'm thinking I might not make it in my car because my eyes, I swear, any second now, they feel like I'm just going to stop because they're just so burning so intensely. As Loya struggles to his car, he hears sirens approaching. There was a moment where I thought I wouldn't make it to my car. I really felt like there's no way I'm making it to my car. Loya finally makes it to his car. He tears off his clothes and stuffs them into the trunk. He sees a cop car flashing its lights directly towards him. I get my sunglasses on and I'm blinking, 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 blinking. And a cop comes this way. And I'm just, just, just hoping that he doesn't like suspect me or that I don't fit the description. And I don't look like the guy who just walked out. I think he's going to turn around for me. So I go down this block. I eventually get out of that neighborhood and I drive to the next town. When Loya pulls up in front of his apartment, he takes out the bricks of bills. The red dye has ruined all the money. I thought to myself, man, this woman was slick. She she made it, so I had to look at her eyes. So I couldn't see that she was giving me what, what amounted to as totally fake money. I ended up having to throw away the money, and it was about $7,500 that I threw in the trash. The incident doesn't deter Loya from pulling bank heists. He continues to lead a double life. Uh, Vegas have a great time, right? <laughs> Using his charm to fool everyone. He could walk into a bank, grab a pile of money, and run. What's really dangerous about him is his charm. Uh, can I have uh, some wine for my So his friends at the time, you know, described Joe as this wonderful guy who had this talent to read people very quickly, see what they were about, mirror that image back to them, and they would suddenly adopt Joe as their friend uh, because they were seeing everything wanted to see in him and he knew how to use this to his advantage how to draw people in close and uh, manipulate them
women find his charm seductive. Joe was charming in, in many ways, but mostly because he knew how to figure out what was important to you and to talk to you about that. And Joe was a big talker, and so he would ask questions and make you feel seen and appreciated. I had a huge crush on Joe, but he had a girlfriend. And we developed a bond really quickly because we both love reading and we both want to be writers. Loya freely spends the loot on his friends. I was buying my friends everything, anything they wanted or they could have. Playing golf all the time and paying $30 for, for golf and then buying all my friends clubs. And I, you know, I just wanted to be that guy, you know. I wanted to be a guy who bought everything. We'd have lunch and we'd play another eight holes and I'd pay for everything. He also uses the money on extravagant shopping sprees. Criminals are incredibly impulsive, man. It's just about spending money. I had a bunch of loafers. I had suits tailor-made in San Marino, and they were all $1,000. I was living this lavish lifestyle because I was no longer poor. Poor was humiliating, and now I was able to live this grand, magnanimous, gaudy lifestyle, and that felt like what I had coming. It's been one year since Loya was released from state prison. In that time, he's got 14 bank robberies under his belt. Authorities still have no idea that Joe Loya is, in fact, the Beirut bandit. The real difficulty in, in working the bank robbery matters is initially identifying who the individual is. On the morning of January 4th, 1989, Loya wakes up with an epiphany. He decides he's ready for the big time. I woke up one morning ready to terrorize some people today. I look in the mirror and I tell myself, don't return today without $50,000. I was going through money so fast that $10,000 wasn't lasting me very long. On the way to Scott, his next target, Loya gets a familiar feeling in his gut. On the way to a bank, my body would get scared. My mind was strong, but my body would start to panic. I would get stomach aches, and that's how humiliating things that happened to you when you were a kid and I would start thinking about my dad and the bullies. So there was this sort of group of, of memories that would instantly incite my rage and my rage would just shove down my fear. He enters the Security Pacific Bank in Orange County. He approached a single victim teller. It's oral demand for cash. Once he got to his getaway car, I presumed he must have opened the pouch and determined that he got $3,800 and thought that was not enough money for him to have made the trip to Orange County. Frustrated by his small take, Loya heads to another bank in a neighboring town. He enters the California Federal Bank in Tustin. His rage has reached a boiling point. He can't think clearly. He went to the desk of a female teller and he leaned over the desk and told her she wanted to have her take him uh, to the bank vault. As they walk to the vault, another bank employee walks by. Loya orders her to join them. Loya's fury is out of control. Get in there now. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. He threatens the two women. Then he does something he's never done before. At this point, he then placed both females on their knees facing the wall and told them to pray to their God. So I tell them to go to the corner and I make them sit execution style, facing the wall, hands at the back of their heads, and I just start menacing them. Loya taunts the two women. He tells them to keep praying to their God. I wanted to make people pay. I wanted to humiliate people. That was one of the things that drove me, was this rage. He seemed to be one who would enjoy this infliction of pain and post-traumatic stress on others. Um, I saw him as being a very, very violent person. He continues to threaten the two women as he stuffs his bag with stacks of bills. Then, he calmly walks out to the lobby and 
exits the bank. I walked out with the most money I'd ever made in a bank robbery. It was thirty-two thousand dollars and some change. From this point on, Joe Loya becomes addicted to going for the big score. Miller hits. He wanted more money. He wasn't addicted to drugs, but he was addicted to to the rush. As Loya continues his double life as a bank robber, FBI agent William Rader learns about his latest robbery. I'm thinking this has really escalated from the point of walking in and doing a one teller, uh, one bandit robbery. After almost 20 bank robberies, authorities are still unable to identify the Beirut bandit. Rader is certain that his high-quality surveillance photos could be the key to solving the case. If we were able to get these published either on television uh, or in the uh, print media, that that we would get an identification from someone who had maybe even a casual acquaintance with him, but would be able to give us a name, and that's really what we were looking for at that time. We needed an identity. By January 30th, 1989, Loy has robbed a total of 27 banks. He's now heading home after hitting up four banks in one day. Suddenly, traffic comes to a dead stop. I'm thinking they've stopped the traffic. They're looking for a guy who just robbed four banks in San Diego. I have a fanny pack with all my money in the back. I have all my outfits that are in the back. I'm kind of panicking. Loya has over thirty thousand dollars in his bag. He knows he must find a detour in order to avoid the roadblock. As he plans his getaway strategy, the indicator light on his dashboard begins to flash. His car is overheating. Loya now has no choice but to get out of the car. He pulls over to the side of the road and grabs his bag. He starts looking for a call box. When traffic starts moving again, Loya is relieved. He realizes that the cops were diverting traffic because of a car accident up ahead. But as he walks along the freeway, a highway patrol officer stops him. Loya knows he needs to turn on the charm. The officer says, going great, great. Where are you going? They ask. And I'm just trying to show them that I'm exasperated, that I'm just a young guy. I'm a good citizen. I know how to play this off because I understand people's cues. I was a fraud. I know how to calm people. I tell them, listen, my yeah, car yeah, broke let's down. Uh, let's have you jump in the back. We'll give you the And they say, get in the back seat. So I open the door and I hop in the back. Loya makes small talk with the officer. I got something of a collegiate look going on. And so I get in there, so where, where, are you, where are you coming from? And I say, San Diego. And they say, what were you doing down there? Well, I met this woman at USC, and um, I came down here for a couple of days. But you know women, they get on your ass, and I just had to come back. I start doing this sort of like, we're men. You understand. So they let me off and roll the window down. All right, man, you take care. And as they leave, I have that same feeling again like of, like, superiority. Like, you're a bunch of idiots i felt powerful at that point because now they had they had me and they just let me go and they had no clue that they had the guy who just robbed four banks in their city lawyer's close encounters with the police don't slow him down he's still hungry for more but his luck is about to run out on february 27th 1989 lawyer robs a bank in cerritos california i take off thinking this is a bank robbery. I know I got a lot of money. And right when I'm getting into the fast, this three sheriff's car just zip past me and I swear I almost hit him. At this point, he thought he was in the clear and headed for home. Lawyer's confident that he's safe. I no longer resemble the guy who robbed that bank. I don't feel like I resemble him at all. I'm driving a nice car. However, he had the window partially down and he was able to hear a helicopter. A helicopter hovers above Loya. Then a sea of cop cars line up behind him. As I'm driving, this one cop car pulls over to my left, and he looks at me, and then he pulls back. And then this other car pulls up on my right, he looks at me, and he pulls back. And then they do a felony stop. Lights all go on, and now I realize they've identified that I'm the guy. Loya knows this could be the end of his run, but he has no intention of giving up. It's a felony stop. He looked in his rearview mirror and saw at least four to five 
uh, patrol units with the red lights flashing. And they came up on him very quickly from behind. And this was going to be the end of the road. Boyle pulls over. He figures the cops have no way of knowing who he is. They must be stopping him for some other reason. I'm upset. So I think, you know what? This is a false stop. There's nothing about me that says they should pull me over. Officers aim their weapons at Loya. A cop orders Loya to exit the car and lay on his stomach. But he needed the air start yelling. Why'd you stop me? And I keep yelling. Why'd you stop? Because this is, I'm going to fight this in court. This is a false stop. As far as I'm concerned, it's against the law. As soon as Loya lies on the ground, two cops immediately rush him. One has a knee on my back. There's guns on me. One guy's leaning on my ankle. They got the bag of money. Got it. And I'm thinking, man, how the hell do they know about the money? And he's holding it like a prize fish. The Beirut bandit is a victim of a new piece of bank technology. The tracker pack. A stack of bills, the center of which has been cored out, and a small electronic transmitter has been placed therein. And once it leaves the front door of the bank, it starts to emit a signal. And this signal can then be picked up in the receiving units of the police cruisers in the area, the helicopter, and also at the communication center at the Lakewood Sheriff's Department. It just so happened that Joe Loya picked the wrong bank to rob and got a hold of the tracker pack and the technology worked flawlessly. The FBI brings in Agent Keith Cordes since the latest robbery falls in his jurisdiction. Bill Rader, who's the bank robbery coordinator in Los Angeles, calls me and said, do you know who you have there? It's Joe Loya. Joe Loya is the Beirut bandit. Loya is brought to the station where Cordes is waiting to question him. Inside the interrogation room, Loya comes up with a phony story. He's not quite ready to give up his freedom. Joe Loya. I tell them, you know, I was parked in the parking lot, and I forgot my wallet, and I turn around, I come back, and um, this guy runs by my car, and he throws the bag, this bag under my car. So I drive away with the money, and next thing I know, a felony stop. You know? I didn't know it was bad money. Cordes doesn't buy his story. The bank surveillance photographs are a match. He knows they finally caught their man. Yet Cordes is intrigued. Loya doesn't seem to be the typical criminal. He was very clean cut. Joe's very articulate. He doesn't fit the mold of the average bank robber who is usually a drug addict. You can do whatever you want to do. There's something about Joe that struck a chord with me that allowed me to speak to him in a different manner. Cordes tells the state attorney that Loya should not be considered a flight risk. His bail is set at just $50,000. Uh, Joe Loya? His aunt puts her home up as collateral. Loya's now out on bail, awaiting his trial. My partner and I walked out, and well, that's it. That's the last we'll ever see of Joe Steve Loya Jr. No. Loya's friends and family are shocked at the news. I had no idea. I'm like a normal person who <laughs> laughed really loudly. I think people do these things all the time repeatedly in their lives, trying to find a way to make themselves feel better, and it, it just doesn't work. Three weeks later, Agent Rader is looking through some recent bank surveillance photos when he sees something shocking. Joe Loya has violated his bail and is back robbing banks. He in no way had changed his physical uh, description. I can't believe that he was as arrogant as he was and thought that he could get away with this. Immediately after the first robbery, I notified Agent Cordes that Loya uh, not only was back on the street, but that he was back robbing banks. When Cordes hears this news, he can't believe he's been double-crossed. When I got the call from Bill Rader that Joe was robbing again, 
I was very surprised. I didn't see that coming. I was blindsided. I felt betrayed that people had trusted in him, and then he had no regard for that. I'm the kind of person that if you've given a second chance or you've stood up for somebody, then you don't go and spit in their face. I think that at this point in time, it was apparent that Loya had proven himself to be the true definition of a sociopath. And that is one who feels that he is the complete center of his own universe uh, to the detriment of family and friends and even to himself. For Loya, bank robbery is a compulsion, an obsession he can't give up. Well, you know what? I'm a criminal. I had no skills of being anything other than a guy who was angry, and I mean, this is what I knew. You know, I wasn't a dope fiend, but I was a fiend. I was a crime fiend. He found a bank robbery to be a great thrill. He was stimulated by this activity, and of course it provided stacks of money to him, which he used to buy a new car, uh, new clothes, and uh, to have a host of uh, girlfriends. I mean, he was living the high life. Loya realizes now the risk is much greater. He's already been caught, and authorities now know who he is. He needs to be extra careful. Helicopter scared me. I definitely felt like, you know, somebody's after me. Somebody's definitely after me. They can make a ton of mistakes finding me. I can't make one. And so there was always, did I make that one? Did I make that one mistake? Cortez scouts any place where Loya might be hiding out. He goes to the restaurant where he worked. He visits Loya's old apartment. He even checks out local golf courses in the area. But Loya is nowhere to be found. You go to places, you talk to people, they... they... Finally, Cordes tracks down Loya's girlfriend. So I can tell you hold it back a little bit. At first, she's reluctant to cooperate. Then, Cordes makes one last push. There's a warrant for his arrest. And if he gets pulled over by a local PD in the middle of the night, they're not looking at Joe Steve Loya, the pretty good guy. They're looking at him as an armed felon, a bank robber. And no telling what would happen. Loya's girlfriend finally agrees to cooperate. She tells Cortez that she has plans to meet Loya at the UCLA campus the following week. Loya wants to give her some money before he flees to Mexico. It's hard. Once we knew exactly the time and the place, we put together a team of younger agents who could stand on the UCLA campus, look like UCLA student. On May 12, 1989, seven undercover agents are positioned around the UCLA campus. They spot a young man sitting down in the student quad. He's sipping a cappuccino, reading the New York Times. They think this could be their man. Joe. Joe Loya. A young undercover agent quickly grabs his arm. Hey, come here. But Loya won't go down easy. Another agent steps in to restrain him. He's grabbed by a female agent. He grappled with her and threw her to the ground. He wasn't obviously going to go quietly. The first agent jumps on top of Loya. But Loya fights back. And I'm just pounding on him, I'm pounding on him. And I'm thinking as soon as I hit them, I'm going downstairs, and then I'm going to go up the back, I'm going to go up the stairs, I'm going to climb out of the I mean, I'm already, like, I know how to get away. Before Loya has a chance to get away, the rest of the agents close in. And all of a sudden, I can't move. All these guys rushed me. I can't move. And all of a sudden, I hear click, click. After 15 months, Loya's run is finally over. He's taken to the campus police department, where he comes face to face with Agent Keith Cortis. They brought him to the UCLA police department, where I was waiting for him. And he was not very happy. He was very angry, and I was angry. Well, I'm thinking, I'm not getting bail again, <laughs> you know, I'm not. They have me, I'm gonna go do time. This was it. My run was up. On the way to the courthouse, Loya and Cortez have another serious conversation. On that ride back downtown from UCLA, we told him that even almost had his aunt and uncle lose their house, that you're still redeemable. I said, look, you're 
You're going to get more time now, but when you get out, you still can change your life. I'm not sure why I did that, but I did. At the arraignment, Boya is charged with only 10 of the 31 robberies identified by the FBI. Count close to 40 bank robberies and an estimated $250,000 in cash. Loya pleads guilty to three robberies. His final sentence is eight and a half years in a federal penitentiary. I think he more than deserved that time in prison. In fact, I think he got off fairly leniently. An eight year sentence with five years of probation for having done 25 bank robberies in, in the Los Angeles division and six bank robberies in San Diego uh, was a fairly light sentence. Eight years was sufficient for what he did. That's a pretty good chunk of your life. Joe could turn around his life when all this was done. Cortez's instincts are right. Loya spends seven years at Lompoc Penitentiary. In 1996, he's released from prison and he vows to turn his life around. Today, he makes his living as a writer and works for an organization that helps addicts change their lives. People change, man. And so somebody who said we don't change, they have the most simplistic knowledge of us as human beings, our capacity as human beings. Loya has also reconnected with his father. I never blame my father. That's one thing he admires about me. I blame my father for punching me in the face and changing my imagination about what it would be like to punch somebody else in the face. But in bank robbery, that was just me having a particular sort of mass of confusion and desperation and insecurities all roiled in one. The investigators who chased him have profoundly different views on whether Loya has truly found redemption. Joe's a productive citizen, married, a father, back with his dad and his family. Life is normal. And I had something to do with that. It took a while. <laughs> it took seven years in the federal penitentiary, but somewhere that light came on. He was a sociopath who enjoyed doing bank robberies, and he enjoyed the money that it was able to bring to him.